So thank you very much for the invitation. And um, sorry, I need to unmute the translator. No, oh, we'll work this way. So thank you very much for the, the invitation. I'm happy to he be here. Sorry for not being in Pristina with you. Um, today I had the opportunity to uh, come and visit last spring, so I have seen that some of the activities that are run by the team of uh, AQH. And, um, so for the 15 minutes that I have now, I will present a very uh, short overview of, um, on the question of gender and uh, chronic diseases and try to see with you why are men and women that equally at risk of developing chronic diseases. So we know that the five major risk factors for non communicable diseases are the ones that are shown here, that's tobacco use, alcohol use, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and uh, air pollution. And I'm giving it now uh, out. My, the main message of this talk, and what I would like to convince you about or show you, is that men and women are not equally exposed to these risk factors that we know for non communicable diseases. So gender should be considered in uh, prevention and control. This is a um, simple message. One way to look at this is uh, through this uh, figure that shows that uh, for the cumulative risk of developing non-communicable diseases, we see that these social factors um, are a large factor that explain these um, the accumulated risk, whereas biological factors explain little part of the accumulated risk. And these social factors that we find again here, smoking, obesity, physical activity, they are highly gendered uh, related factors. And this is demonstrated in uh, most of the literature that we can find. And as I said last year, uh, while I was in Kosovo, I looked into the data that you had for Kosovo. You do have some data. And this is coming from um, the cohort that um, is conducted, is still running, if I'm not mistaken, that was started in 2019. And this is uh, baseline data with about 1,000 participants. We can see here differences between men and women throughout these known risk factors for non-communicable diseases that we see differences. So about 30% of men who are current smokers for 15% of women. Physical inactivity is also higher or is higher in women, also high in men. Poor nutrition is not different between uh, men and women, but significantly high. And we see here alcohol consumption is higher in women and almost non-existent uh, in women. And we see this large difference in obesity between women and men. So you can see from the data that you have uh, here for Kosovo that these uh, risk factors, these more risk factors, are not equally distributed between men and women. So now we, I will discuss on what we can we do for this. But I would like to when we say that these data are stratified by sex, or separate between men and women, what do we mean by sex? What is this sex that is used um, in research? So I found on Wikipedia, uh, identity card coming from Kosovo. I assume this person is not uh, known or it's a fake ID. But what I want to show is we, for most of the data that we have in research or that we have in health, we use the sex information. It's coming from our identity cards. And it's binary men or women or female or male. And this uh, indicator is actually, if you think about it, it's coming from our birth certificates. When we are born, our external organs are. Uh, identified as being belonging to a baby girl or a baby boy. And this is what we use in research. Uh, it's this indicator of female and male. If we go a bit into the complexity, you have the individual here in the middle, 
Um, and we can say that it's like the coin has two faces. One face is on the right side of the sex dimension, and the sex dimension is related to the biological attributes of humans and animals, and uh, including physical features, chromosomes, gene expression, hormonal levels, and anatomy. So we all have these biological factors, and at the same time, we are being socialized in societies that propose roles and behaviors that are more or less strongly um, dedicated to belonging to uh, the women gender or the men gender. And these are the socially constructed roles and behaviors and expressions. We think of alcohol consumption. Um, there are norms that dictate who is um, who should be drinking what and when. Uh, if you think of risk-taking behavior that is much higher in men, this is not uh, biological, there's no biological reason for this. This is induced by socialization of how men and women should behave. If you think of interaction between individuals or parents and women, these are highly gendered roles and uh, behavior. So the point is that the health-related factors for non-risk uh, factors for non-communicable diseases they are not determined by biology, uh, but they are determined by social norms. So these smoking, physical activity aspects, they are dependent and they are uh, modulated by a gender system that we find in just about any society. And if we go further into this gender dimension, we often um, talk about four dimensions of gender. The first one is gender identity, and that's about how an individual self identifies, including how they behave, express their gender, and are perceived by other people. And I put this um, picture here, if you think of uh, uh, small children, we socialize them in different ways whether they are boys or girls, through color codes, through encouraging some of the, of the behavior or of the expression of being calm and quiet or, on the contrary, being more um, expressive. Then the second dimension is this gender relations dimension. And this is rather about how individuals interact and are treated by other people based on their received and expressed gender identity. And one example related to health that we can think about is gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is a result of gender relations. Um, so gender-based violence, of course, is uh, more women are affected by gender-based violence because of these um, gender power dynamics between men and women. The third dimension is um, related to gender roles. And these are the social expectations and norms typically associated with a given gender. And here are the examples that we can give are the ones that we find uh, in risk factors that smoking or diet. There are roles and there are expectations of how people uh, behave regarding to these, uh, these different roles. And you can think also of the parenting clause, what is expected uh, from being a mother or from being a father in uh, the duty of educating uh, children. And the last dimension is about institutionalized gender, and these are the way power, resources, and opportunities are distributed in society based on gender. And here, an um, example you can think of is the gender division of labor, which is a topic that has been studied in sociology, showing that the example being on construction sites, I'm sure in Kosovo you find the same thing that you would find in Switzerland. On construction sites, you mostly see men working on construction sites because our society has decided or designed that some type of work are uh, work for men and some types of work are rather for women. So it means that if we have gender division of labor, we may have a gendered difference in the exposure to air pollution, for example. 
if you're working on highways or working with a chemical. Another example would be uh, the well-known and documented sexism in public spaces, which will affect the way that women uh, occupy public spaces, such as parks or different areas where physical activity would also be. So this is to show the different dimensions that are from the individual dimension to the more structural dimension that are all framed uh, a gender system. Going back to the example of smoking, uh, it has also been documented that um, the tobacco industry is very good at their marketing and using these gender stereotypes. And most of the um, of the publicity for smoking, taking up smoking, was until the 1960s, was targeted to men because there was a social norm that men, it was a value for men to smoke, it was a sign of masculinity. And um, the marketing or the tobacco industry was very good at spotting that through female em emancipation in the 60s and the 70s, it targeted women and also encouraging uh, women to take up smoking um, as a sign of also being strong and uh, emancipated. And this has, uh, this we can see through the data, and this is the smoking prevalence in Switzerland. I don't have the data for Kosovo, the longitudinal data. Um, you can see that in the 19... There were just about no women smoking, with more than 50% men smoking. And um, smoking has been increasing in men, uh, thanks to the public health campaigns. Whereas you see this high jump here, 16 and 70 of women taking up smoking. And their prevalence hasn't reduced, um, and now we have a prevalence that is quite thin. I found uh, these data um, that are similar to the cohort that I showed before, but that's, uh, you probably are very familiar with these steps survey. Um, it indeed shows that men, there are more than 30% of men currently smoking, or about 15% uh, of women. And it would be interesting to see if the prevalence... Recording in progress. If the prevalences are um, also changing. Uh, through the through the life course, and uh, one interesting thing you can see is that um, in direct uh, correlation with these lines here, you see the prevalence in um, in um, cardiovascular diseases, in lung cancer diseases that are increasing in women with a delay of time, but uh, there is a direct link between the smoking prevalence being a risk factor for uh, the non-communicable diseases. So uh, this is summarized also in this figure that we, again, we see that there are biological factors uh, that differentiate uh, men from women. And there are these society-induced gender constructs of lifestyle, nutritional habits, exercise, and smoking that frame uh, also the health of men and women. And if we want to act in terms of prevention or health promotion, it's in this bubble that we can act to, um, to change these risk factors in terms of the differentials in risk factors. Whereas there are also these dimensions of disease per um, perception, of seeking behavior, use of health care, decision making, and therapeutic where we can act. This is where we can act in terms of service delivery, which is the interest for this panel. And we know that there are differences in attitudes between men and women in checkups and screening, where men are less socialized to um, take care of themselves and take care of their health, and they are less likely to come for screening. And once they are screened for not for chronic diseases, we also see differences in the adherence to treatment control, um, um, glycemia to control hypertension. So um, here we see these differences, and these are things we can act on uh, to change the differences in the health uh, of
And of course, there are many different pathways that are also non communicable diseases, and you can think of the estrogens that influence metabolisms involved in blood sugar regulation, or the visceral fat depots that are different between uh, men and women. And uh, this reference, uh, this figure here, is coming from an article published in the Lancet uh, two years ago. Um, and if you're interested to read it, 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 it's really a review of what is the state of knowledge on sex and gender differences throughout the different non-communicable um, diseases. And um, one of the last points I wanted to make is that men and women are not homogeneous groups. Of course, but there are many variations within the group of men and within the group of men, if we think about biology, but also social aspects. And uh, there are other dimensions that affect social position and health, and that's ethnicity, age, of course, and socioeconomic status. We know that when we uh, talk about chronic diseases, age is an important factor. We look at women before menopause and after menopause, but there are also good evidence showing that the risk factors that I'm talking about are not equally distributed between ethnic groups or socioeconomic status. And I think this is also very much uh, valid for Kosovo. So, as I said, I um, had the, the chance to come and visit Kosovo last year, and uh, from the, the, uh, the work that we conducted together with the team from the Swiss TPH, we made some recommendations for service delivery, thinking about how gender uh, can be included in the strategies. Uh, one aspect we discussed is motivational counseling that we do with patients um, who suffer from chronic diseases. And one recommendation was to avoid a discourse on individual responsibility that may be stigmatizing, generally, and to assess the capacity for individuals to adhere to clinical recommendations such as physical activity, diet, and include structural perspectives. It's often not a matter of goodwill of being physically active or eating um, healthy food, but there are strong social norms and living circumstances that drive these health-related behaviors. So when we do motivational, motivational counseling as health providers, we should take into account these social norms that are gendered and uh, work at this structural level. If we think of screening and control of chronic diseases once patients have been uh, diagnosed, uh, maybe one recommendation would be to organize activities with men only to discuss, because we know that they adhere less um, to the control of the chronic diseases, so we could organize activities with men to discuss and understand their perceptions of a healthy body or an ill body, of clinical screening and the best venues and approaches to attract men in such activities. And then in terms, and, I'm, and this is my um, one before last slide, in terms of the health promotion, so a bit beyond service delivery, um, there could be one recommendation could be to assess if gender-specific health promotion or prevention activities are pertinent in addressing the gender inequality in physical activity and obesity that is mostly found in women in Kosovo, um, to ensure that women adequately are reached and adhere to the um, uh, health promotion uh, messages. We could also think of identifying personal and structural barriers uh, to physical activity in the specific context of Kosovo ensure that these gender norms and roles are taken into account. Again, it's not about uh, goodwill, individual will of changing health-related behavior, but there are these um, structural gender norms that should be tackled. And to tackle these uh, social norms or structural aspects, this means that the policies or the activities um, should be taken maybe outside of the health sector, and this is a link to the health in all policies um, discourse of the WHO and other actors that um, in, uh, in, uh, to, to reduce the inequalities that we see in health, 
we need to act at the health level, but also throughout these other sectors of transport, housing, uh, professional nutrition, and water and sanitation. So, as I had already said, the key messages for this short talk in the very, in very summary is that the risk factors known for non-communicable diseases are gendered. So we should take gender as a break and do the response that we have. And gender intersects with other dimensions that are age, class, ethnicity. Um, and prevention should be gender sensitive, but also um, such practices should be gender sensitive and gender specific to avoid reinforcing the inequalities that we see. So I will stop here and I thank you very much for your attention.